Today we're going to talk about uh, XRD analysis of polymers. So hopefully um, you've taken my Engineering 45 course or watched some of those videos. Um, and actually, hopefully you've done our XRD lab together, which was really, really cool. Um, but anyways, let's review a little bit of the basics of XRD. And then again, if you have any questions on kind of X-ray diffraction, you can look at ENGR 045 OER textbook on UOP, University of the Pacific. You can look at lecture one and there'll be some details there. But um, essentially the idea is uh, for X-ray diffraction, you have an experimental apparatus like this and we shoot an instant ray of radiation, which is basically an electron beam, copper alpha radiation. And electrons have uh, a really interesting, they have particle wave duality. Basically, uh, they're kind of quantum mechanical in nature. They can behave either as a particle or as a wave. And you could kind of look at this um, with the kind of famous, the double split uh, well, slit experiment. Einstein, actually Jung did it, but essentially uh, if you have a diffraction grating, so you have two grates here, if you shoot uh, kind of paintballs through it, you should just expect kind of the pattern on here just to be these two straight lines. But if you shoot electrons because they're waves, basically you get kind of this diffraction pattern where you have these kind of multiple uh, basically diffraction grating and kind of this, inter these um, they're referred to as interference bands. Interference. So particles or electrons can behave as either particles or wave, particle wave duality. So one of the key aspects of getting X-ray diffraction is you need to have kind of constructive interference. So the incoming and the outgoing, the scatter wave must constructively interfere. They have to kind of add constructively. You kind of think of this as like uh, either waves of the beach where you get like kind of what I call a double decker. So you'll have one wave coming and then the one wave kind of comes next to it and they kind of merge and become huge uh, and they the amplitude here essentially doubles so two times your amplitude because you're adding um, this wave with a certain amplitude. So in 100% fully constructive interference, we're going to get uh, kind of this increase in amplitude. You could also kind of think of it as like a pond. If you've ever watched uh, the Muppets, Kermit, uh, when he's like uh, the frog, Kermit the frog, when he's throwing kind of, uh, well, he's kind of problematic now, but anyways, rocks uh, in the ripples that you kind of see. So sometimes the ripples, you know, amplify, and sometimes you get destructive interference. So when we're phase shifted by 90 degrees, when we add these two waves together, the resulting is a wave or wave or, a, you know, essentially a sine function with an amplitude equal to zero. So we are going to get um, a signal basically when we have fully constructive interference. So what Bragg did, and again, Bragg, youngest uh, Nobel Prize winner, at 25 with his dad, that record will never be broken. Um, but who knows? We never know. Uh, basically, we have an incoming, um, the way that your experiment is uh, run is you have your sample. So we have kind of a sample here. Actually, let's look. There's lots of different kind of schematics, but I can try to draw one. So I have my X-ray source. So, X-ray. So this is my source. It shoots in. Uh, and then we have a sample here. So here's my sample. And then that sample is going to rotate uh, theta some theta angle just to kind of change this uh, incident angle. Sometimes this x-ray source will actually rotate uh, angle theta, but in the one that we have in the lab, and the one that I'll post a video on uh, pretty soon, uh, uh, basically our sample will rotate. And then you have essentially a detector at this kind of two theta angle uh, here. So we have some detector, so the x-ray comes in, bounces off, goes to our detector, and that detector is at this angle of two theta apart. So, and then you get a result plot of intensity versus two theta. And when you get peaks, you get this kind of constructive interference. So let's look at this example for a metal. So a metal, again, we have discussed it before, perfect long range, or you know, perfect, relatively perfect long range order. So we have this incident beam coming in here, and you have another incident beam again. We're shooting it at the same kind of angle theta here. So this is still theta as well. So it's hitting this, it's hitting this. So these beams of electrons, or these kind of waves of electrons, um, or just these electrons, uh, this, these uh, radiation wavelengths with a wavelength lambda are coming in and they're striking an, uh, an atom in your lattice and then they're bouncing off. So they strike here and here. So if these two waves, the you know, if these two waves here, if they constructively interfere, if they add, we can then use that relationship 
you know, if we see a spike here, if they constructively interfere, we could use a relationship between, you know, the fact that they constructively interfere to deduce something about the distances in our uh, crystal here. Specifically, this distance right here, that distance right there is going to be our dHKL. So this is the interplanar distance. Now, this D can be general. The HKL indices are distances between interatomic planes. And um, again, Bragg, Bragg developed this express, uh, you know, this expression is specifically written for metals, but it is, you could, uh, this Bragg relationship 2D sine theta equals N lambda. This is a more general term because, again, this is just some characteristic distance uh, in your material. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Anyways, if these two waves constructively interfere, we know that there's some extra distance travel. So between here and here, the extra distance is just this AB and this BC component. So if they constructively interfere, I know that they are basically in phase. So this extra distance, AB plus BC, is, has to just equal to some integer number N times the wavelength of our uh, incoming or instant ray, uh, radiation. So for kappa alpha radiation, I think it is 1.54 angstroms. Don't quote me on that, but I think I might be right on that. Anyways, um, uh, that is going to be kind of our, our, our wavelength. Uh, so we can then use just simple, you know, again, this is a Nobel Prize winning, you know, formula. And again, it's not trivial to kind of derive, but just now, simple trigonometry. We know that AB is going to be equal to, again, this DHKL sine theta, BC, DHKL sine theta, you add them up, and we get our Bragg expression, you get a Nobel Prize. So that is fantastic. So let's look, now that we've kind of reviewed uh, X-ray diffraction, let's talk about uh, how we could use uh, XRD, X-ray diffraction, uh, and to do, to do some critical information about the structure of our polymers. So first things first, if I have an amorphous polymer, like polystyrene, for example, which I know is fully amorphous, versus polyethylene, which I know can be, especially high density, can be very crystalline. Or, you know, somewhat crystalline. Um, what are the X-ray diffraction patterns going to look like? Well, again, you get sharp peaks. The same, you know, the key, uh, the key idea here in this relationship is we see that, let's go back here, we see that this distance, D is going to be inversely proportional to 1 over, you know, uh, basically, 1 over theta. And actually, in this plot, you're, it's, the distances are inverse proportional 1 over theta or 1 over 2 theta. So shorter uh, theta values correspond to uh, what types of distances? Larger distances. Large thetas, smaller distances. And if we have sharp peaks, it's very similar to, again, uh, this kind of, you know, again, if you're getting kind of these sharp peaks, you're getting kind of a strong signal. Uh, it's indicating that there's some... A uh, large degree of order at that distance. It's very similar to our PDF functions that we talked about in previous videos. So if we have sharp peaks, that is indicating again some uh, well characterized or uh, well established long range uh, translational order in that system. Because again, this holds that distance is kind of uh, being observed at all these different. You know, we get the same instant rate of that reflection or that constructive interference here, 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 and propagating. You know, so forth and so forth. Um, if the rate, if the if our signal or if our intensity is broad, it's indicating exactly like what we talked about previously, where you're getting kind of, again, these kind of mixed, there's some order here, but not, you know, all the way propagating throughout your crystal. So the larger this peak width, the more disorder. So the more, basically, this would be more like an amorphous material. Amorphous. Sorry, I can write that well. Uh, actually, let me close this guy out. Uh, Excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, anyways, let's get back into our picture here. So, what you'll find if we plot uh, an I versus 2 theta curve here and here, you would see that for polystyrene, these can be very, very broad and very few peaks, whereas for uh, polyethylene, you might have one of these sharp peaks. Again, not like a metal. A metal will look like this, where you're just going to have these delta functions. So that is not going to be the case for uh, you know a polymer. So there's still going to be some width of these peaks, but you're going to have more of these peaks. Again, very similar to PDF. So let's look at a more fun example uh, and how we could do some real um, 
we could kind of actually figure out the structure of our polymers by just looking at an XRD plot. So I'm looking at um, this family of methacrylates, PMMA, PPMA, PEMA, PBMA. And what I get are these uh, plots right here. This is my resulting XRD analysis. So first, let's look at um, what's happening here. So this is my family of methacrylates. And all that's changing is uh, the number of these kind of repeat. So here, this is just CH3. Here, this is not R2. It's actually CH2, then CH3. And then this is CH2, CH2, CH3. And you get the picture. So all that's changing is the length of this kind of side group here. So if you kind of imagined and sketched out, this is kind of the distance for PMMA, or kind of a, uh, an idea of the structure uh, of PMMA. So if you look here, I have some certain characteristic distances in this polymer. So all I'm doing, this is just an ATAC, you know, this is just a polymer here, and it's, you know, kind of biting around, or I'm looking at kind of the chain, you know, kind of wrapping around here. So I could see some characteristic distances. So one distance is obviously this, you know, carbon-carbon bond length, the intra-chain distance. I'm going to call it that, that distance. There's also this inter-chain distance, so the distance between this chain and this chain, and that depends on, obviously, this length here. Um, there's also kind of this distance L, so the distance between, basically, our monomer, kind of, our monomer units repeat. So you could kind of look at, this is our monomer unit, so this is basically the distance between monomer and monomer. And then finally, R distance, just basically the length of this side group. So... If we look back now at this uh, curve here, there's some really interesting things that start to happen. Uh, so, again, let's remember this Bragg angle is inversely proportional to distance, uh, or distance is inversely proportional to, to theta. So what I see here, or what I'm looking at, at large, these peaks all seem to kind of line up. So they occur at the same, you know, two theta value. So at large two theta values, so large two theta, my peaks, because these are for four different, again, I don't know which, you know, I don't know which polymer, you know, family of PMMA this is, but I know something is kind of happening uh, interesting here. So I need to figure out which of these curves correspond to PMMA, PPMA, PEMA, PBMA. But I know that these peaks at large two theta values are conserved. They're like they occur at the same two theta value, right? The, the height of that peak. So Basically, it's saying that there's some distance here between all these different families that's not changing, right? Because the distance only changes when 2 theta changes. So at large 2 theta, what distance am I uh, working with? Large 2 theta, small distances. So let's look at some, let's look back at our structure and see, okay, well, where are the distances, what distances aren't going to change? So in these polymers, the only thing that's changing is the length of this side group. So is this distance going to change? Oh, yeah, right? Because it's right here. What about this distance? Definitely. But the distances that aren't going to change are this carbon-carbon bond length, the short distances, because this, and then this distance right here. That's not going to change depending on, again, the side group. So those distances are conserved. Those, again, small distances, large theta peaks, are conserved between your polymers. Now let's look, look what's happening here you start to see kind of these peaks shift. So like, it's hard to see this peak here, but you can see this peak now it's shifting to the left and more and more to the left. You kind of see, right? Like I have a peak here and I have a peak here and then here and then here. The same thing for this guy. Like there's could be a peak here, 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 here. It's shifting a little bit to the left. It's shifting just a little bit to the left. So as we go down here, these again, and now these are, small two theta values. So what do they correspond to? My two theta small, these are large distances. And we see as we go further down, the, the theta, the two theta gets even smaller, it moves further to the left. So as we go down here, these peaks are shifting to the left, and the distances are becoming even larger. So let's look again, what distances are changing between our polymers? Well, this interchain distance, as we go from PMMA to PBMA, this side group is going to get longer and it's going to push. It is going to, this distance is going to increase. What about this R distance here? Well, that distance is also going to increase as well. So we can deduce that this is PMMA, this is PPMA, 
this is P-E-M-A, this is P-B-M-A, and we can kind of see how these distances are changing in this polymer. So we've deduced a lot. We, we, first off, we've identified the structure. Uh, we've identified what material that we're looking at. Uh, we see that there's some conserved distances here in our polymer structure, and we found that there are some distances that are, uh, again, changing, right? Because, again, the structure, you know, there's going to be some characteristic distances. So these distances are going to be kind of, you know, when you look at the polymer, this distance is kind of always generally going to appear. But we can see from the shift in the peaks that the dis how the distances are changing and then what distances we could basically reproduce by just looking at this, actually, this, this figure was deduced and actually, you know, kind of drawn schematically by just looking at this XRD plot. So we saw that there were some distances that were changing, and we know that the only, you know, one of the main things that's changing between these structures is that side length. So uh, you can do uh, a lot, essentially, with these XRD plots uh, in order to figure out uh, kind of the, the structure of polymers, uh, which distances are changing, which distances are not changing. So you can kind of read more about that there, but that's kind of the key analysis. Furthermore, you could actually get a little bit quantitative as well. So if you have... Uh, peaks like this, if you have a material that you think is semi-crystalline, you could run uh, basically these curve-fitting softwares to kind of see, like, in each of these peaks, what's the relative amorphous uh, kind of uh, contribution to this peak, and what's the relative crystalline portion, and you could basically deduce percent crystallinity by looking at the, uh, basically, crystalline contribution or percentage versus, like, the total area. So, you could kind of deduce that, which would be basically the amorphous plus the crystalline. So you could do, there's curve fitting softwares in like any, any you know, in almost all XRD machines now at this point that can do this for you. Uh, so, or at least help you get to this. Yeah. So, XRD is a powerful tool. Again, this Bragg expression is not just specific for metals. It is any, any uh, again, we call this D, this kind of characteristic distance. Uh, in our material. Uh, so we could kind of deduce, okay, what's, you know, are the characteristic distances that repeat in my polymer, are they increasing, decreasing, what's happening? And then from that, I could deduce what's going on with the structure. So next time, we're going to look at our last kind of experimental, but a really, really crucial one, this DSC analysis. So differential scanning calorimetry, uh, which is basically this thermal analysis technique, very, very useful for measuring properties uh, of materials, so specific heat, melting point, boiling point, glass transition temperature, diffusion, reaction kinetics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can kind of figure out uh, how we could use this to characterize polymers. So I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.